Toyota's GR Supra revives a classic sports car formula with a bit of Teutonic help. It's fast, it makes a statement, and it's been developed by real enthusiasts. What's not to like? The legend returns. That's the advertising tagline Toyota's opted for with this model. It's GR Supra sports car. Is the Supra model line legendary? Well, it certainly has a colourful history that was worth resuming, but the way that Toyota has done so here was not without controversy. It certainly produced a fascinating end result, though, as we'll see in this test. Quite a rare thing, a Toyota sports car these days. After all, the only one launched in the last decade has been the GT86. Half a century ago, though, things were a little different. It was Toyota who produced Japan's very first serious sports car, the 2000 GT of 1967, which then set the scene for a string of more affordable Celica sports coupe models, more powerful versions of which gained Supra-badged derivatives from the end of the 70s. The second generation A60 series Celica Supra was first imported into our market in 1981 before the Supra became a model line in its own right with the Mark III A70 series version of 1986. It was the fourth generation A80 series Supra model of 1993, though the enthusiasts tend to remember a model quickly recognised alongside Nissan Skyline and the Honda NSX as a modern Japanese sports car classic. A position cemented by a starring role in the very first Fast and Furious film and a prominent place in the original version of Sony's Gran Turismo PlayStation game. By the turn of the century, though, as Toyota's attention became consumed with hybrids and SUVs, the Supra was forgotten. The buyers that had once loved it drifting away to other brands when production ended in 2002. And that might have been that, had not BMW found itself in need of a partner to develop the third generation version of its Z4. Teaming up over a shared design that could also produce another Supra initially seemed a good idea. Toyota knew that fans of the previous car would want the same front-engine, rear-driven formula with straight-six turbo power. Engineering the Munich maker was well-placed to provide. But opinions in Tokyo and Bavaria quickly differed over the kind of end result the market might want. And the project, having initially floundered, only really got back on track when it was decided that the two companies would use the same basic ingredients to produce two quite different models. BMW's was to be a convertible roadster and Toyota's to be a harder core, more enthusiast orientated coupe. The car we have here. This is the first Toyota to be produced entirely by the brand's competition division, Gazoo Racing, hence the GR Supra badging. It's built alongside the Z4 on an Austrian production line in Graz, but uses only the top engine found in its BMW cousin, a 3 litre 335 bhp unit that is indeed a turbo straight six. Chief engineer Tetsuya Tada describes this as a sports car without compromise, which, if true, would certainly be an achievement given the need here to somehow bond a Toyota body shell to Bavarian engineering and produce a purely focused end result. Is that what we've got here? Time to find out. You'd think that Toyota might have had enough of joint sports car design by now. GR Supra chief engineer Tetsuya Tada certainly has, seconded into this at times rather acrimonious project directly after finishing the equally fractious one with Subaru that brought us the Toyota GT86. This time round, though, you sense that Tada-san got more of what he wanted. And this is it. The kind of classic straight-six, front-engined, rear-wheel drive sports car it's no longer particularly fashionable to make, but which so many real enthusiasts around the globe still adore. The twin-scroll turbo power plant has 500 newton metres of torque and 335 braked horses at its disposal. All of them, as you will have read elsewhere, Bavarian in origin which of course has led to endless media comparisons between this car and its BMW Z4 M40i development cousin. 
Tada san hasn't got much time for any of that, pointing out that all the dynamic elements that really matter, namely the settings used here for suspension, steering, and the electronically controlled differential, are all Toyota's own. <laughs> going to compare the Supra to another car, he says, compare it to a Porsche Cayman. But that, of course, is another potentially inaccurate benchmark. The 718 series Porsche being rather different due to its mid-engined four-cylinder configuration, though that car's power output, performance figures and price are all very similar to what's provided here. Emotively, in a contest between the two, you'd have to award honours to the GR Supra. Its straight six may be somewhat smothered by emissions regulations, hence the need for extra artificial amplification through the stereo speakers, but it's still vastly more tuneful than the Cayman's flat four. And that's a vital attribute in a sports car of this kind. So is searing speed. 62 miles an hour from rest is dispatched in just 4.3 seconds on the way to an electronically limited top speed of 155 miles an hour. And there's a beautiful sense of chassis balance, an attribute insisted upon by the engineers at Toyota's competition division, Gazoo Racing, who were given the job of creating this A90 series model. Over thousands of laps spent pounding round the Nürburgring Nordschleife, they perfected its ideal 50-50 weight distribution and developed a chassis even stiffer than that of the carbon fibre Lexus LFA supercar. It also helps that the centre of gravity is somehow even lower than that of the GT86, which you'd think might have an advantage in that regard with its low-set boxer engine. Add to all that a wide track and prodigious grip from a particularly broad-beamed set of Michelin Pilot Supersport tyres, and you've got the recipe for a real B-road bruiser. Even before you start to add in the various elements of BMW-sourced electronic assistance. There are two. First, an active differential that works on the rear wheels is powered by an electric motor and is governed by the car's VSC or Vehicle Stability Control System. When cornering at speed, this setup allows as much as 1,500 newton meters of drive torque to be directed from a faster turning wheel to a slower turning one, helping to propel you from bend to bend. Oversteer or understeer is nipped in the bud without the need to brake, making it possible to power out of corners with remarkable verve and flattering you into thinking that you're the next Fernando Alonso. Also standard is AVS, or Adaptive Variable Suspension, which works via the selectable normal and sport drive mode settings, adjusting the shock absorber force at each wheel to maintain a flat vehicle posture in response to changes in the road surface. As usual with drive modes, these ones also influence steering, engine and transmission response with settings you can customise via a sport individual centre screen menu. We mentioned transmission. Now, in a Porsche Cayman rival, you might expect to find either a manual gearbox or a double clutch auto, but this Toyota opts instead for a straightforward ZF eight-speed torque converter auto box that's embellished with launch control and directs power to those rear wheels via a multi-link rear axle. So all the key ingredients are in play here. Well, almost all anyway. Arguably, the most important one, lightweight, isn't a particular Supra attribute. This fifth generation model weighing in at around one and a half tons, which to give you some perspective, is an enormous 400 kilos heavier than a rival Alpine A110. To be fair, a Cayman tips the scales at a figure much closer to that of this Toyota, but that car's mid-engined configuration helps to mask the fact. The bottom line is that on a twisting road where either of those two cars can be simply thrown into a corner at almost any speed on dry tarmac, this one's body movements need a degree of management and driver anticipation. You might prefer that, of course. An inexperienced driver could certainly make more of a difference at the wheel of this Toyota. 
especially on a track, though here you might start to wish for a touch more steering feel, a touch less cornering body roll, and a much more powerful set of brakes. All of these being factors you'd think it would be well within Gazoo Racing's power to perfect. The manual gearbox, which could easily be added, but which Toyota will probably never offer, would complete things beautifully, as would a touch more power. Somewhere inside this design, an astoundingly capable super sports car is dying to get out. But that would be a track day special. This is a car you could use every day, it being as happy collecting your dry cleaning as it might be at Silverstone or Suzuka. Refinement is pretty good by class standards, though not helped by the fact that there's no physical barrier between the cabin and the boot. Plus, the gearbox is super smooth and in normal mode, the suspension easily smooths out undulations and tarmac tears in a manner you simply wouldn't expect a really capable sports car to be able to do. Transcontinental motoring would be easy in a GR Supra. You simply couldn't consider it in an Alpine A110. And you might even think twice about vast distances if you owned a Cayman. Safety system provision is also on a different level to either of those two cars. Which leaves us with what? Well, certainly not the BMW clone that the ill-informed might suggest this car to be. Instead, thanks to the efforts of a small group of passionate, dedicated engineers, it turns out to be a credible evolution in a classic sports car line. For us, though, this A90 series Supra shares most in concept and execution with the design that inspired its model series in the first place, the legendary Toyota 2000 GT of 1967. And that's not a bad heritage to draw upon. You'd expect a car that's had to borrow so heavily from shared componentry to be something of a compromised design. Yet, of all the five Supra generations produced since Toyota unveiled its iconic 2000 GT sports car back in 1967, there's little doubt that this one gets closest to replicating the romance of that original model's classic styling. The original brief that Toyota started out with wasn't initially what BMW had in mind for its version of this car, but chief designer Nobuo Nakamura stuck to it throughout. His so-called condensed extreme concept, epitomised by the FT1 concept car of 2014. In profile, you can clearly see its key elements. A short wheelbase, large wheels and a wide stance, a taut two-seat only cabin and a long bonnet with a compact body reflecting the purest combination of an inline six-cylinder engine and rear wheel drive. It's certainly extreme. The voluptuous rear haunches, the double bubble roof line that delivers this unusual upper silhouette and these Curious slashes in the front wings that seem to serve no purpose we can discern, aesthetic or practical. You certainly can't accuse this car of being understyled. Get beyond that and you start to pick up the thought that's gone into this design. This car's perfect 50-50 weight distribution was achieved only because the engine was shunted as far back in the body as it would go and equal effort has gone into the way the blacked out A pillars and character lines on the side of the roof emphasize the taut compact cabin. The sharp looking robust lower sills that express the car's high rigidity and the way the back edge of the bonnet and the rear spoiler are set at almost the same height linked by a low belt line. At the front end, it's just as extrovert. Here, you might see glimpses of the previous A80 series model in the air intakes and narrow LED headlamps, but this Mark V model is very much its own car with a lower, more expressive stance, emphasized by a prominent central grille flanked by large corner cutouts. Toyota says these are essential for cooling, but close inspection of them reveals a large upper blanked off section that would be about as effective for that purpose as these arbitrary vertical slashes below the headlamps. These lights integrate a six lens LED arrangement incorporating both the turn indicators and the daytime running lamps. 
The rear, if anything, is even more in your face. This arching spoiler has been optimized to suppress lift, while the bumper's trapezoidal shape is supposed to generate a sense of movement down and out towards the tires. The evil-looking LED tail lamps illuminate with a classy ringed signature, and the fog lamps and reversing lights are formed by dot LEDs grouped in the centre of this menacing lower diffuser, which incorporates two huge silver tailpipes. Details matter too. The sweeping S on the Supra badge here is apparently modelled on the famous twisting Verschiefen section of the legendary Nürburgring Nordschleife racetrack. Enthusiasts will love it all and might perhaps feel all this effort to be in some way compensatory for the fact that almost everything you can't see here is shared with BMW. As we've observed elsewhere in this film, the GR Supra sits on the same CLAR or cluster architecture platform as that brand's G29 series Z4 sports car, but is a few millimetres longer and narrower than that car. Enough, let's take a look inside. Toyota claims the cabin design's been influenced by the cockpits you get in single-seater racing cars, which is why some might find the high waistline and low driving position a touch claustrophobic. The dramatic view forward over the long bonnet also requires some adjustment, but overall, most in this car's target market will love the focused driver-orientated feel this interior delivers. What Supra fans with wider brand experience might not like so much is the vast amount of shared BMW componentry on show here, most of which Toyota hasn't taken much trouble to hide. The iDrive multimedia system, virtually all the switch gear, the gear stick, the door handles, the column stalks, the display fonts, all of it's lifted directly from the Z4. Even if you hadn't experienced that car, you might feel the end confection to be rather curious, particularly after dark when the Toyota badge on the steering wheel isn't illuminated, but all of the Munich maker's secondary knobs, stalks and switches are. That's one way of looking at it. Another is to wonder whether if Toyota had relied entirely on its own parts bin, the end result would have been more befitting to such an expensive sports car. We think not. In any case, there's also quite a lot here that's different to what you'd find in a Z4. The great-looking supportive sports seats, the thin-rimmed steering wheel and the bespoke instrument cluster screen you view through it, complete with prominent 3D effect orange rev counter and white digital speedo. The fascia design, dominated by these flowing mid-level central vents, is different too, which isn't necessarily better because the central part of it isn't angled toward the driver as it is in the BMW. Plus, the infotainment screen isn't so well integrated and, at 8.8 .8 inches, is significantly smaller too. Ah yes, the infotainment screen. You can't imagine that a BMW styling studio would have signed off the kind of positioning of it that you get here. The iDrive monitor squashed into a letterbox style format that can be difficult to read, especially in bright sunlight. Toyota has added its own startup graphics and warning messages, but otherwise you get all the same fonts and menus that you would in any BMW. If, like us, you're tempted to grumble further on this point, bear in mind Toyota's observation that changing the warning messages alone meant the addition of 20,000 lines of extra code to change the entire system would have added a significant increase to this car's overall asking price. Would you care enough about this issue to pay that? No, we wouldn't either. In any case, there's lots about this infotainment setup you wouldn't want to change. Everything you need is here, including a 10-speaker audio system, navigation, Bluetooth and voice recognition. Plus, this is one of the only Toyota models to be currently fitted with Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring, though there's no sign of Android Auto compatibility. And you get a far better range of so-called connected services than are offered in the Japanese brand's other models, including a concierge service that, at the press of a button, can help when you need journeying assistance. 
There's no doubt that BMW has gained engineering expertise from this project. Hopefully, the same is true of what Toyota might have learned when it comes to this level of media connectivity. What else? Well, little touches like the classy knee pads provided for both passengers and the carbon fibre finish for the lower part of this centre console are appropriate to this car's premium price point, which compensates to some extent for the lower grade plastic used on the glove box lid and the bottom part of the doors and the rather wobbly white stitching on the dash. That apart, build quality from the Austrian Magna Steyr factory seems pretty strong and getting comfortable oughtn't to be too difficult. Tall folk will like the way the double bubble roof aids headroom, but be less appreciative of the way the ridge separating the front part of the cockpit from the boot prevents the chair backs from sliding or reclining back too far. Otherwise, you should find it easy to get the leather-stitched steering wheel and the integrated sports seat with its body-holding side bolsters just where you want them. At which point, you'll appreciate that despite the low-slung seating position, forward and side visibility are fine. As usual, in a sports coupe, though, your over-the-shoulder view isn't, so you'll be needing the standard parking sensors and rear-view camera. Cabin storage isn't anything to write home about. There's no centre storage box between the seats. An overhead sunglasses compartment is missing and the door pockets are tiny. Plus, the tray provided ahead of the shard-like gear stick is so shallow that the contents will deposit themselves onto either your feet or those of your passenger the first time you throw this car into a sharp bend. USB and 12 volt ports are provided here, plus a wireless charging mat if you've opted for this upper spec Pro model. The glove box is at least reasonably sized and you get twin cup holders by your elbow, plus there's a ticket clip on the driver's sun visor and a little stowage net in the passenger footwell. Unlike previous Supra models, this one's not a 2 plus 2. So, as with most cars in this segment, there are no tiny pews out back that might be used for small children or designer shopping bags. So, just about anything you want to carry needs to go in the boot. A rear hatch, just like the kind of thing you'd get in a rival Audi TT RS or Jaguar F-Type Coupe. Accessing it is a little fiddly. There's no outward catch, so to release the tailgate, you'll need to either press the button inside the cabin or click the key fob. Then once you have, prise your fingers into the slim crack that opens up on what will inevitably be grimy paintwork. Once the hatch opens, the engineer's efforts at ultimate torsional body rigidity are particularly evident in the curvaceousness of the lower aperture presented. Easing the access of bulky items clearly wasn't a design priority and sure enough the high-ish load loading lip and slimmed in sides will make that difficult. The capacity is rated at 290 litres which is less in total than you get from a rival Porsche 718 Cayman but there the room available has to be awkwardly split between front and rear boots. Here there's less faffing about and Toyota promises that there's enough space for a coupe's weekend luggage, a track day or a trip to the golf club. Practical touches include a 12 volt port on the right together with an elasticated strap for holding the manual and on the left there's a light and a small net. There's no space beneath the boot floor, just a fixed cargo base with four tie down points. Oddly, there's no dividing section between the boot and the cabin, just this high ridge at the end which incorporates the huge audio system speakers. The designers claim the lack of a separating wall was intentional so as to increase loading practicality for longer items. Plus, it can be handy to be able to reach back into the boot from the cabin. On the other hand though, hearing your bags sliding around in the boot area can be really distracting when you're pressing on down a winding road. The GR Super range is straightforward. This single coupe body style and one three litre straight six twin turbo engine that from launch was offered in a single 335 brake horsepower state of tune. Pricing might cause a quick intake of breath from those who remember the relative affordability of earlier Supras. From its introduction, this one listed at just under 
£53,000 in its standard form, but the vast majority of buyers in our market opt to find the extra 1300 to get the up-spec pro version we have here. To the first 90 European buyers of this fifth-generation A90 series Supra, Toyota offered a limited-run A90 edition version, which cost £56,495 and quickly sold out. Will there be other options in the future? Well, Toyota isn't saying, but there probably will be. Chief engineer Tetsu Tada says that a manual gearbox option hasn't been ruled out in the unlikely event that it turns out there's significant demand for one. And clearly the brand could insert the four-cylinder engines that BMW offers in the Z4. The brand already sells a four-cylinder GR Supra in Japan. Race versions of this car may also proliferate. Toyota Gazoo Racing already offers the GR Supra GT4, developed to allow private drivers to compete in the FIA GT4 competition category. If you can only dream about racing or owning a GR Supra, well, fear not. Toyota's thought of you too. Entering the fast-growing world of e-motorsports and joint developing with Sony the GR Supra GT Cup game for PlayStation 4. Get good at this. And you can even race your e-GR Supra in the FIA-accredited GR Supra Cup online race series. But let's get back to this road car. Like other reviewers, we've talked a lot elsewhere in this test about this car's joint-engineered close cousin, the BMW Z4, the top M40i version of which shares this GR Supra's engine. And at the time of this test, cost just over £49,000. But because that car is a convertible and slightly more of a GT than an out-and-out -out sports car, Toyota contends that it can't really be compared directly to a GR Supra. Instead, they were targeting another Teutonic sports car competitor, Porsche's 718 Cayman. As you might be able to tell from the fact that a comparable Cayman S costs around £54,000 and puts out 345 horsepower. But it's only got four cylinders and would cost considerably more than a Supra if specified to a similar level. What about other competitors? Well, what do you call a proper sports car? BMW's M2 competition model probably qualifies under that description, despite the fact that it shares the same body shell as a hairdresser's, a 2 Series Coupe. This M2 uses the same 3-litre straight-six as this Toyota, though in uprated 410 horsepower form, but at the time of this test was in its run-out phase, with the last available examples costing around £51,000. Enthusiasts won't spend too much time considering either Audi's TT RS Coupe, which uses a 2.5 litre, 395 horsepower, five cylinder engine and costs around £54,000, or the Mercedes AMG SLC 43 hardtop coupe roadster, which uses a 3 litre, 390 horsepower, six cylinder unit and costs around £49,000. Better is Jaguar's F-Type P340 Coupe, which uses a charismatic supercharged 340 horsepower 3-litre V6 and costs around £55,000. You might also have the rather lovely Alpine A110 on your shopping list, which is pitched at around £51,000 in the plusher legend form that most customers choose. It's only got 252 horsepower, but its lightweight means it has the performance to match a Supra, though it's not as day-to-day -day usable. There's not much else for a potential GR Supra buyer to look at. A Lotus Exige Sport 350 Coupe, which has... 350 horsepower and costs around £60,000 is too circuit focused to comfortably use day to day. Years ago, we'd have said that Lotus's other sports car, the Evora, was a better bet, but that's now far too expensive. The single GT410 Sport variant now on offer costs around £86,000. There are various comparably powerful sports coupes on sale for Supra money. A Mercedes AMG C43 Coupe, for instance, and even a hot hatch in the shape of the Mercedes AMG A45, but those are really different kinds of cars. If, having considered all of this, you conclude quite understandably that there's nothing quite like a GR Supra, then you're going to want to know just how generous Toyota has been with a standard kit tally. So let's take a look at that now. And most of what you'll want features on the standard version, which gets piercing adaptive LED headlamps and these lovely 
19 inch black and silver five double spoke forged alloy wheels with red brake calipers along with an alarm also headlamps and wipers led tail lights automatic headlamp leveling heated auto dimming mirrors all-round parking sensors and a rear view camera plus there are key driving features like adaptive variable suspension, an active sports differential to help get the power down through the turns, and a drive mode selector with normal and sport settings, along with an individual menu that allows you to customize your own driving preferences. The eight-speed auto gearbox also gets paddle shifters and a launch control function for lightning starts. Inside, there are Alcantara upholstered sports seats with heating, cooled ventilation, power adjustment and a memory function. There's also dual zone air conditioning, an auto dimming rear view mirror, a USB port and a smart entry keyless entry system. There's aluminium finishing for the pedals and the door scuff plates and infotainment taken care of by an 8.8 .8 inch center dash screen. Your access point for a 10 speaker audio system, navigation, Bluetooth and voice recognition. The infotainment setup also includes something rare to find in a Toyota, Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring. This particular setup wire free so you don't have to mess around plugging in cables. Should you go further and get yourself the upgraded Supra Pro spec model we've got here? Well, it's tempting. This plusher variant adds full leather upholstery, a 12 speaker JBL premium audio system, a wireless charging mat and a head up display. The limited run sold out A90 special edition model we mentioned earlier, added unique paintwork, red leather sports seats and a special matte black finish for the wheels. You'd expect a modern sports car of this kind to be properly connected and sure enough, all versions of this Toyota are with so-called connected services that let you seek help when you need journeying assistance and it isn't convenient to use your phone. There are selectable weather, news, online search and wiki local options and included as standard is a concierge service that can locate restaurants, book hotels and even update you on the status of your flight. And if you have an iPhone, you'll be able to download an app giving you access to various Toyota Supra Connect services. Able to do things like remotely lock or unlock your car or help you find the thing if you've forgotten where you parked it. If you need to check your Supra's fuel level, range or mileage from wherever you are, you can simply open the app. And should you need to sound the horn, flash the headlights or change ventilation settings, you can do that too. What's more, Toyota Supra Connect also allows you to send your next destination to the navigation system from your phone with one tap. What else? Well, unless you specify your car in solid lightning yellow, you'll find that all the available paint shades cost extra. There's the premium solid shade we have here, Prominence Red, plus five premium metallic finishes in white, black, silver, ice grey or deep blue. The final shade, Matte Storm Grey, is reserved for the limited edition A90 variant. Let's finish with a look at safety kit. Now, all versions of this car get the Toyota Supra Safety Plus pack, which includes the five camera-driven features that most new Toyota and Lexus models now offer. You can brief yourself on which systems are currently active and customize the setup by pressing this safety system button below the gear stick. The key camera safety element as usual these days is front collision warning, autonomous braking. Toyota calls its setup a pre-collision system and it works as all these kinds of setups do, scanning the road ahead as you drive in search of potential collision hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. This setup is also able to specifically identify people and cyclists, and it will apply braking if a pedestrian is detected in front of your Supra at speeds of between 19 and 50 miles an hour. 
The other four Safety Plus pack features can be quickly covered. A lane departure warning system, lane departure alert with steering assist, warns you if you've drifted out of your lane, applying steering lock to ease the car back to where it ought to be. It works seamlessly with an intelligent adaptive cruise control system able to regulate your distance to the car in front and if necessary slow you right down to a standstill then start you off again. Finally, automatic high beam automatically dips your headlights at night and road sign assist pictures road signs on the move displaying them on the dash. In addition, you get an e-call emergency call system that will alert the rescue services with your exact GPS location if the airbags go off in an accident. An attentiveness assistant that will constantly monitor your driving reactions for drowsiness. A blind spot monitor which alerts you if you're about to pull out when there's a vehicle in your blind spot. And rear cross traffic alert which warns you of oncoming traffic if you're reversing out of a space. As for more conventional safety kit fitted to all GR Supra models, well, pretty much everything you'd expect is present and correct. So, tick off a pedestrian-friendly bonnet, Isofix child fastenings, and seven airbags, twin front, side, and curtain bags, plus a driver's knee bag. Across the range, you'll also find a tyre pressure monitoring system and hill start assist control to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and an emergency brake signal for panic stops. In addition, there are all the usual electronic driving aids for braking, traction, and stability. We didn't expect too much here. With a curb weight of around one and a half tonnes, the GR Supra is hardly, after all, the lightest sports car of this kind. Around 100 kilos of its overall weight taken up by all the emissions and safety legislation introduced since the previous generation model left production. It tips the scale 65 kilos, or the weight of a fairly fit passenger, heavier than its arch rival, the Porsche 718 Cayman. Though that's partly, of course, because there are two extra cylinders fitted up front. Impressive, then, that this Toyota manages to be considerably cleaner and more frugal than its Zuffenhausen rival. The GR Supra records 170 grams per kilometre of NEDC-rated CO2 and 34.5 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle, which should give a reasonable operating range from the 52-litre fuel tank. For reference, the figures for an equivalent 718 Cayman PDK are 193 grams per kilometre and 31 mpg. That emissions figure means a 37% benefit in kind tax rating that really isn't too bad for a powerful sports car of this kind. And it allows this Toyota to just about edge into the 151 to 170 grams per kilometre tax band, which in turn means that your first year vehicle excise duty payment would be £350. On the Porsche, it would be 1280 a flat annual VED charge of £145 applies after the first year, along with an additional £320 per year added in years two to six of ownership, thanks to the fact that this Toyota costs more than £40,000. Insurance is rated at Group 41E. For reference, a BMW Z4 M40i is rated at Group 37, and an Audi TT RS is rated at Group 40. Depreciation is key, of course, with a car of this price. Industry experts reckon that this Toyota will hold its value exceptionally well at first, as you'd expect given the lengthy waiting list in place at the time of this test. After three years and 30,000 miles, they reckon a GT Supra Pro like this one will still be worth £29,800, or 56% of its original new value. The thinking is, though, that over time, rivals like the 718 Cayman S and BMW's M2 competition will reassert their usual brand superiority in this regard. The GR Supra is covered by a five-year, 100,000-mile warranty, a notable improvement on the limiting three-year or 60,000-mile packages you get from brands like Porsche, Jaguar and Alpine in this segment. 
Supra buyers also get five years of pan-European roadside breakdown assistance, a three-year paint warranty and 12 years of anti-perforation cover. And extended warranty can be bought at extra cost as part of a package that includes free MOTs and extended roadside assistance cover. As for looking after your car, well, routine maintenance is needed every two years or when the service indicator lamp comes on, whichever happens soonest. Finding a dealer to do the work should be easy thanks to Toyota's large network, but costs won't be cheap thanks to the large engine and the performance orientated brakes. Those large tyres won't be cheap to replace either, so bear that in mind before you go track day showboating. There's a dedicated MyT app that allows you to book a service online using your phone, and Toyota has a fixed price servicing plan, so you'll know in advance exactly how much any work will cost before you check into a dealer. Is this an uncompromised sports car as Toyota promises? Of course it isn't. No joint engineering project can ever be quite that. The sort of Supra chief engineer Tetsuo Tada and his colleagues would have created from a clean sheet would surely have been different from this A90 series model, but perhaps not so very different. Because the company stuck to its guns on what it wanted from this car, the end result has stayed true to the essential tenets of Supra development. And because of the BMW shared engineering, which was what made the whole thing viable in the first place, this model could be brought to market before the onset of emission regulations that in future will severely curtail the oral excitement that cars like this can offer. Tada San sees this as an old-fashioned sports car, and in many ways it is. There's something timeless about the feel of a classic front-engine sports car with a lightly loaded driven rear axle that you just don't get from supposedly purer mid-engined models like Porsche's 718 Cayman or the Alpine A110. Of course, an old-fashioned approach is inevitably also a slightly heavy-handed one. Expect this Toyota to handle with quite the agility of those two rivals and you could be disappointed. It would certainly be slightly slower than either the Cayman or the Alpine in the lap times you'd record on a circuit. But 99% of your driving life isn't spent on a circuit and day to day we can imagine how a GR Supra buyer might value this car's emotive soundtrack and more muscular feel over the pure handling perfection delivered by those two competitors. The considerably increased boot space, much stronger standards of safety provision and extra equipment would also probably be welcome too. It's not perfect, of course. Like some other commentators, we've come away from driving this car feeling that somewhere inside it is a firmer, leaner, harder-edged racer simply dying to get out. What a Supra this would be with slightly sharper steering, fractionally firmer shocks, 100 kilos less weight and the more powerful version of the same straight six engine that BMW used in its M2 competition model. We'd ideally want the super slick manual gearbox that the Bavarians fitted there too. Perhaps somewhere on a Gazoo racing test track such a car already exists. For the time being though, we can understand why many will quite happily take this GR Supra just as it is. Reviewers like us shouldn't be criticising this Toyota for what it can't yet be, but giving thanks for the fact that against the odds in a market obsessed with silly SUVs and dull electrification, a car like this has made it to volume production. It's special and memorable and different and fun. Exactly as a Supra should be. <laughs>